Good morning, I'm Cinda. This is the third Sunday in Advent. And we begin our service with the lighting of the Advent calendar ca candles. <laughs> Charlie did the same thing last week. <laughs> what is that? Lighting of the candle of joy. And the candle of joy joins the past two candles of hope and peace. The light glowing from our Advent candles are burning brighter. This radiance warms our hearts and fills us with joy. The Lord has done great things for us. Let us rejoice. Amen. That's good. Please pray with me. Dear God, we have, we have much, much to do, do and we, we are, are not sure we will be, we will ready, be ready for the, the day, day of your coming. coming. In Advent's light, help us to see what is important, to be who you want us to be, and to do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good, morning. good afternoon if you are not in this time zone. Good evening if you're even further east than that. My name is Reverend Lewis Mitchell. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And it is good to see your half faces. And it is good to see all of you and your full faces and little boxes on our screen. We thank God for the opportunity and the challenge of doing hybrid worship together. Amen. Amen. We want to give special thanks to our tech team who rally every week to try to have us look much more put together than we might feel. Amen. 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 If you ever really want to know what it looks like behind the scenes, come on down and volunteer a bit. Um, I'm sure your hands and hearts would be welcomed. But more than that, I want to say that this holy place of gathering, this time together, made holy by the God in each of us, the God that surrounds all of us, the God that is above, below, beneath, within, without, everywhere. It is holy because holiness is. This place, Alki Community Church, is located on the land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish. We try, with our words and our actions, to both support them in their agency by our admission and our acknowledgement of being on their land, and also by contributing to Real Rent Seattle. If you are new to this time with us, or new-ish, if you'd like to have more contact with us, reach out. We'd love to have more contact with you. You are welcome to this church of Jesus Christ. A final note for those of you that have come from other traditions or no tradition at all. If ever there is a question about something that we're doing in the course of our worship, please ask. We aren't doing this for us. We're doing this for you and all of us. And we want to take you along. It is a habit of folks in clergy to sometimes use code for things that people who don't come to church have no idea what we're talking about or what we're doing. We want to try to stop doing that as best we can. So help us to correct ourselves by bringing your questions, your thoughts, and your concerns. We welcome you. Call to worship. Here in this place, we discover the great things God has done in story and song, in silence and sacrament, we are reminded that God's relationship with us lasts forever. Here with these people, we find our true home, where we can run home laughing after being lost for so long. Here during this holy season, we hear those promises made so long ago of the one who repairs all our mistakes, of the one who reshapes our brokenness. Come, give praise of joy, for God is always, always with us. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Our first reading from Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 10. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw the angel, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And oh, by the way, he must never drink or have wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. The second reading from Matthew chapter 1, starting with verse 10. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Sometimes it's easier than it looks, often not. I was glad when they said unto me, let us enter the house of the Lord. It is a joy to see you in person and online. This week, our Advent light is signifying joy. So we're going to have a little, we're going to start with a little practice, making joyful noises unto God. Here we go. Repeat after me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come, Spirit, come. come. All right, now that you're all warmed up, I want you to feel invited to be responsive as you feel led at any point in the worship service. Amen? Amen. Sometimes I will exhort you, but if, if you just feel a hallelujah in your spirit, you just go ahead and pipe right on up. This is not your grandfather's church where you have to sit quietly and suck on a mint so that you don't make any inappropriate noise in the solemnness of church. I can almost assure you that church solemn has its place. But in this time and era, church excited has a place too. Amen? Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious God, open our hearts today. Warm us with your light. Light a fire in us for justice, mercy, and grace. Make each of our hearts full with the promise of new birth. For any of us who are burdened with grief, God, please be comfort. For any of us burdened by lack, please be resource. For any of us burdened by isolation or loneliness, please be the hand of community reaching for us. For any of us burdened by estrangement from our families or loved ones, be the promise 
of safety, new family, and the gift of connection. See our needs and pour love, grace, peace, and joy into us, we pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, God. My rock, my redeemer, repairer of my mind, body, heart, and spirit. Amen. I want to lift up in our thoughts and our notions all who have been affected by the tornadoes. Um, I uh, checked in with my, my brother last night. He lives, he and his new wife, they've been married about a month now. Wait, is that right? No, he got married in July. He didn't tell us till a month ago. And I did tell him that he skipped that step of having her approved by the family. Um, but since she's a grown woman and he's a grown man, I guess our approval wasn't completely necessary. But they live about five miles away from that Amazon building. Um, and and uh, I was uh, very happy to hear that they were okay. Um, but just really our prayers to, especially I think to the families who still don't yet know the disposition of their loved ones. What an awful place to be, uh, to be just in pre-grief and worry. We hold them in our hearts today. So you may already know this about me, but I love every opportunity to lift up the lives, authority, and power of women and other non-male beings. Amen? In the Bible and in life, our biblical history is chock full, steeped in fact, in patriarchal language and patriarchal primacy. I believe that this particular bent has led to things like war in the name of peace. Marrying flags and national identities to God. Claiming that God loves one nation over another, that God loves one race over another, that God loves one gender over others, and I want to be clear, this is not God saying these things. Men who profess to speak for God are saying these things and calling it gospel. Go ahead and say amen, because you know I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Regardless of our good intentions, the outcomes have been hurtful and deadly. I'm still challenged by a theology of centering men and only men as the only recipients of God speaking. If you have a hard time centering the theology of the lives and testimonies of women, consider this. Jesus, who we claim as the center of our faith, had no need of a man to be born. I want you to let that sink in for a minute. I realize that, you know, I'm all about the bro code when it suits me. I haven't outgrown that yet. But really, it wasn't about the man of the hour. And I want to add to that a little bit of history and backstory, the prevailing science of that era was that babies were, in, were created via insemination, meaning that the baby was located in what the man passed on to the woman. Hence the prohibition, hence the prohibition against wasting babies by spilling semen outside of procreation. When you go back to the Old Testament and you look at onanism, that wasn't about a, um, a, a particular activity that was prohibited. It was about don't, get, don't waste these babies. We need them for farming and livestock. We know more about the science of birth now. And honestly, they were doing the best they could with what they knew. Since I don't suspect, I'm looking around, we are a very um, well-seasoned group, most of us. But I don't suspect any of us were born in the time of Christ. Anybody? 
Okay? Always good to ask. You never, you never know. We weren't born in the time of the writings, the stories, the testimonies, the letters. All of these things that were chosen, translated, compiled, and edited to become what we call the Bible. Since we weren't there for any of those councils or the original carrying on of these storages, stories by voice and then by writing, all of us were taught by others who were taught by others, who were taught by others, mostly men who had absolutely no compulsion to interrogate their standing in the church or in the church's teachings. There was nothing about that that made them feel like maybe we should look at this more holistically because why? If you've got everything, then you don't notice that something's missing. Let us focus on the beginning and the end of this Christ that we claim. If we read the Bible as holy text, in the beginning of Christ, there was Mary. At the end of Christ, there were Marys. Did, uh, did you hear any uh, guys in that part of the story? At the beginning of Christ, there was Mary. At Christ's earthly end, there were Marys. As often, the men came later. But they were the ones telling the story. And so their names are lifted up. Elizabeth and Mary supporting one another in their uncommon, unusual, unexpected pregnancies. Zechariah and Joseph got visited by angels to prepare them for their roles. And even then... Zechariah was like, I hear you, angel, but for real? I, I'm not sure that's possible. So he got muted. You know, I, I love that mute button on my phone. God pushed a mute button on Zechariah and said, hmm, you don't believe me? All right, well, you just sit right there and be quiet because I don't want to hear from you until this is done. The Marys that were at the burial site of Jesus, they were the witnesses to his absence in the tomb. The male disciples were hiding, afraid, confused, and stunned by disbelief that Jesus had been crucified. Think about it. They didn't understand what was said at the Last Supper, all the uh, allegories and analogies that Jesus used. They were like, wait a minute though, he's supposed to live forever. What just happened? So while they were trying to figure out what to do next, it was the women who went to tend to Jesus again. At the beginning of life was Jesus and a woman. At the final time of his earthly life, it was Jesus and women. These Marys, although they were not identical, stand as midwives to the formation of our faith. They ushered in the pivotal moments in the birth of Christ and the death of Christ on earth. They ushered in news of the resurrection of Christ. These are the midwives of our faith. If that's too much for you to hold, then I'm gonna move forward to modernity. It has been my experience in my relatively short life, most of it spent in the life of the church, that women do most of the work of ministry. Amen? Amen. Women, often without title or benefits, they tend to the new lives of the church. They tend to the old lives of the church. They tend to the broken lives of the church. They prepare for worship and communion. They provide food for whoever needs to be fed. They maintain the order and they decorate our houses of worship. They attend to our meetings, the planning, the minutes. They keep our records. They do our correspondence. They make sure folks in the community know what's going on. They make sure we know what's going on in the community. They connect us to organizations and other churches that need to be supported and those that need support for us. They manage our Christian education. 
They provide support and sustenance for all of our big events, all of our small events, and every in event in between. They prepare for our ordinations, our baptisms, our funerals. They know which crystal goes with what place setting and how to put the table together so that the family feels honored and welcomed. Amen? Hallelujah. In times of crisis and war, they tend to our wounds, physical and spiritual, and a million other things that women do to keep us men together. I don't know if you know it or not, but without the benefit of a good church secretary, all I can say is it would not look the way it does. Things would be decidedly different and not for the better. And when was the last time you heard of a church secretary that wasn't a woman? You know, we're bricks, but women are the mortar. has always been true and will probably remain true. If your male pastor is on a pedestal, you can rest assured that what forms that pedestal is at least one woman. And those women, that woman who forms his pedestal, they are the people who are doing the work, who are doing the praying, who are providing the shoulders and arms on which he stands and succeeds. Amen? Historically, when all pastors were men and all of their partners were women, that role, the role of first lady, was also a lot of work. It was a lot of sacrifice, a lot of understanding and compromise, a lot of working through the burden of getting whatever was left when the pastor came home. It was a lot of lack of privacy, of church needs interrupting uh, family time together. And it was also a fair amount of loneliness and lack of support because there was a certain need to hold an image and community that was also attached to that role. It was a lot of solo parenting, a, solo, a lot of solo house tending. It was a lot of doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Any preacher's kids in the house that can say amen to that? Amen. You know, when you're around and you're thinking and you're behind the scenes, when pastor gets home and pastor's cranky because he's used up all his user friendly, the kids and the partner get whatever's left. It's important as we lift up the name of Jesus that we also really commit to seeing the world beyond a male-centered binary way of thinking. There is none among us. But let me speak for myself. I know I could not, could not be all that I can be without the incredible love and support of the woman who stands by my side. And the mother who still prays for me and the daughter who still looks up to me. It is these central people in my life that allow me to hold it together so that when I come to you, I actually look like a cogent package. I may not look as raggedy as I feel. Karen won't let me leave the house looking raggedy coming to church. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a ministry in that of making sure that, you know, pastor looks like he got dressed on purpose today, you know? I want us to commit to upholding the stories often written in the margins of our lives and Bibles and history of the women and other non-men who seem to always be there behind the scenes, keeping us together. Bob Marley said, no woman, no cry. Pastor Lewis is saying today, no woman, no Christ. No woman, no Christ. No woman, no Christ. I'm going to end with a prayer from the book called The Gathering, A Womanist Church, by Irie Lynn Session, Camila Hall Sharp, and Jan Aldridge Clanton. It's a wonderful book if you have a chance to read it. And if you need to know the title again, hit me up during the week. I will certainly send that to you. 
Come, let us proclaim our faith in the creator of all life, the solid rock on whom we stand, the spirit who stirs visions in us. Together we celebrate our faith and encourage one another to keep our faith strong, steady, and growing. In this community, we find faith to endure. Struggles and sufferings, fears and frustrations, we stand together on the solid rock who gives us courage and strength. As partners with one another and with all who suffer, we work to end abuses and injustices. By faith, we move forward together on our mission of dismantling racism, patriarchy, misogyny, and sexism. Together, we draw power from the spirit who supports our justice call and takes down every wall. On her, we can depend her grace and goodness never end. The desires of our hearts are placed by the Spirit. She gives us all that we need to make our dreams reality. So let us claim and proclaim our big dreams, moving forward with steadfast faith. We envision a world of loving kindness, justice, peace, and equity, a world where people of all races, all genders, and all cultures are free to become all we are created to be in divine image. If our vision seems delayed, we will wait for it. We will live by faith, believing, as it says in Habakkuk 2, 3, believing that it will surely come. Amen. You know, on that redo of the sermon, I was much nicer. I was much more heavy-handed in the first round. But I thought I'd be kind to you all today and not beat you up too badly because joy, it's joy week. As we enter this time of prayer, um, I got some really good feedback from folks about the uh, last prayer that I uh, offered um, from the Polynesian and Maori people. Um, throughout the rest of the month, I'm going to be offering Lord's prayers from various points of view. This week is no exception. This week's Lord's prayer that we will end with is a retranslation from Aramaic. Um, the translation was done by Dr. Dr. Kathy Chapman. Um, there are lots of ways to pray, and I like having a kaleidoscopic prayer life. Amen? <coughs> Incline your hearts to in prayer with me as we go before God with our needs, our concerns, and our words of thanksgiving. God, we come to you because you've invited us. You've invited us to your throne, if throne is an analogy that works for people. You've invited us to your bosom. You've invited us to your embrace. You've invited us to just crawl up into your lap. Like unsure children needing affirmation from a loving and gracious parent. We come to you knowing that some of us are grieving, some of us are worried, some of us are hard pressed to make sense out of how to put a Mary in Merry Christmas. As we come to this place together, we pass many who are unsheltered, facing the elements and still trying to find some semblance of joy in their lives. Let us continue to be a blessing to them. Keep them safe, God. Keep their bodies safe. Be a warming light to carry them through this cold and wet and unkind season. We ask you, God, to be 
a hand of mercy for our caregivers in hospitals, in nursing homes, in every institution where someone has to get up and leave their family to go and tend to someone whose family may or may not be present for them. Give them grace. Give a special measure of patience and joy to those who are serving as chaplains today, God. Those for whom parish ministry might be a delight, it might be a burden, but they find themselves going from ward to ward, bed to bed, people who have different beliefs and no beliefs at all, and they're just bringing the light with them. Whatever people call the light is up to them. They're bringing the light, the peace, the connection, the witness to people who are often in the worst moments of their mortal lives. Be energy for them today, God. Be an opening and a resource for those who are still looking for work or looking for sustainable work. Be mobility to those that are challenged to move as freely as they would like. Be accommodations to those whose disabilities are not cared about when they come to join in public spaces. As we lift up the names in our own voices and in our own hearts, receive them and hear them. You know what we're praying for before we even open our mouths to do so, God, but we lift them up to you as a show of our faith, as a show of our humility. We don't stand in pride before you, God. We stand in need and in belief. I invite you now, as you feel led, to lift up the names of those who you wish to hold in prayer. Yes. 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 Chris Avery. Please receive those we've named, those on our heart that we have not named aloud. God, in this moment, I want to lift up a prayer for all of those who we hold in resentment. All of those who have done us harm and we have fear and shame about engaging with them over this holiday season, so we just don't go home. We're still angry about how we were treated, God. Help us to release the anger. Help us to be free from the chains that bind us in hard feelings. Not for their sake, God, but so that we have cleaned up our side of the street and we don't have any debris standing in the way between the sunlight of your spirit and our yearning hearts. Forgive us. Restore us, revive us, set us on a new path. One that lingers in love and one that lets go of old hurt. I pray for our leaders today, God, on all sides of the aisle, Break through the partisanship, the bitterness, the anger, the fear. Break through all of it, God. Help them feel the humanity that drove them to do public service in the first place. 
take them back to that place where their heart felt a flame to serve the public. Remind them. Remind them of the joy of giving before they got too caught up in the game of winning. I also pray for those who are entering this first holiday season, holding close to the loss of a loved one. Be mercy in their hearts, God. Be mercy in their hearts. Fill that empty place setting with love and remembrance. Help them find the bitter sweetness of grief and love everlasting. There are so many in this time who are estranged from churches and temples and mosques and places of worship where community can gather because somebody told them that God couldn't and wouldn't love them. Touch them, God, and let them know that you know them, you love them, you created them. And if it is on their heart to find community, send them to safe places where they will be embraced and adored and lifted up and reminded that they are beloved of God. For every house that has turned someone away because of our narrow doctrinal views on who is and isn't your beloved, forgive us and start us all over again. God, we're guilty. We're guilty of creating us and them when you said all. Forgive us, God. Give us another chance to love on those that you love, to serve those that you would serve, to hold those who you have held. We pray, God, that we have this opportunity one more time to be your church. I want to invite you now to lift your heads and look at your screens as we together share this Lord's Prayer. O cosmic birther of all radiance and vibration, soften the ground of our being and carve out a space within us where your presence can abide. Fill us with your creativity so that we may be empowered to bear the fruit of your mission. Let each of our actions bear fruit in accordance with our desire. Endow us with the wisdom to produce and share what each being needs to grow and flourish. Untie the tangled threads of destiny that bind us as we release others from the entanglements of their past mistakes. Do not let us be seduced by that which would divert us from our true purpose, but illuminate the opportunities of the present moment. For you are the ground and the fruitful vision, the birth power and fulfillment as all is gathered and made whole once again. Amen.